Kings chapter 14. We're going to start in verse 21. In just a few minutes we'll get there, but get your, get your scriptures ready. What is something every father would like to do? When we think about our children, what would we like to leave them? We would like to leave them, if you love your children and your grandchildren, you'd like to leave them an inheritance. And the scripture affirms that goal. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the sinner's wealth is laid up for the righteous. Fathers should want to position our children in the best possible way in life and beyond our lives. Not only during our lifetimes, but beyond. We want to give them what will help them be successful far beyond our lives so that our children's children and our children's children's children uh, are blessed by the legacy we leave. Now, of course, we pass along more important items than money. And most importantly, we pass along Christ. We entrust the gospel to our children. But leaving a financial inheritance, as this proverb points out, is also a good thing. We have to recognize something, though, something about inheritance, something about entrusting in the generations to come. There's a flip side to this. There's a dark side to what we pass along to our children. And this applies to fathers, and it applies to mothers, and it applies to all of us. But I do know, I do know that some dads are haunted by this reality we're going to talk about here this morning, and that our scripture is going to surface for us. You see, we dads are called by God to be the heads of our homes, and God has given us authority commensurate with the responsibility that he's called us to. But we fall short of the example that we're supposed to be, and we know it. We sin, and we know it. We're not all that we ought to be. We don't teach everything we should teach. The potential for regret is it's tremendous. We fail to perceive the nuances that we should perceive. We're dull when we should be sharp, and sometimes we use too many words when we should be listening. And sometimes we're silent when we absolutely needed to be speaking. We wrestle with our own sin continually while at the same time seeking to teach our children the righteous life of Christ. We call our kids to trust the Lord, and at the very same time, we're fighting the murmuring, murmuring complaints that come out of our own hearts against the Lord. And those are just a few examples. What I'm driving at is this. We don't want to, but we end up passing along our own sin to our children. It's not the kind of inheritance we want to give to them, but they inherit the sin nature through us, and they are exposed to our specific sins in their early formative years and in the years that follow. It's a devastating, unavoidable reality that pains every godly father. But as you have probably expected, and you may even know through experience, God never leaves his people without comfort, without salvation, and without hope. The Lord upends the pattern of inherited sin so that it is no longer the controlling, driving, determinative force between father and child or mother and child or between any of us and any of the rest of us. This is true for Christian fathers and mothers and for all of God's people. God has delivered this powerful truth to us through redemptive history. And we're going to see it this morning through the lives of three successive kings. I'll condense it like this. Take heart. God disrupts our inherited sin with his grace. Take heart. God disrupts our inherited sin with his grace. Yeah, sometimes we look at our 
our heritage. We, we look at ourselves and we look at, at, at what's going on with our kids. We, we look at that whole line and we say, oh my, my God, where is there hope in any of this? And if I can't, how will they? Take heart. God disrupts our inherited sin with his grace. And we're going to take this passage in three parts. First of all, compounding sin, compounding sin. Have you ever watched a sporting event on television and it was so bad that you just couldn't take it anymore? Maybe it was your team and you said, that's it, I've seen enough. Um, I'm moving on. So you change the channel hoping for something better to watch. Well, reading here in, in 1 Kings and these, these previous chapters in chapter 14, it's a little bit like that. Last week, we saw the immediate apostasy of the northern kingdom of Israel. They separate from Judah and their brand new king, Jeroboam, this is the northern kingdom, they went to work on separating themselves culturally from Judah as well and religiously from Judah as well. And so Israel turned immediately to idols and false gods and pagan worship. And, and so, okay, we look at this and, and we're reading along, okay, let's change the channel back to Judah. Let's see if they're doing any better. And that brings us to 1 Kings chapter 14, verse 21 and following. Let me read for you 1 Kings 14, 21 and following. Now Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, reigned in Judah. Rehoboam was 41 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city that the Lord had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. His mother's name was Naama the Ammonite, and Judah did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy with their sins that they committed more than all that their fathers had done. For they also built for themselves high places and pillars and asherim on every high hill and under every green tree. And there were also male cult prostitutes in the land. They did according to all the abominations of the nations of the, that the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. In the fifth year of King Rehoboam, Shishak, the king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem he took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He took away everything. He also took away all the shields of gold that Solomon had made. And King Rehoboam made in their place shields of bronze and committed them to the hands of the officers of the guard who kept the door of the king's house. And as often as the king went into the house of the Lord, the guard carried them and brought them back to the guard room. Now the rest of the acts of Rehoboam and all that he did are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? And there was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam continually. And Rehoboam slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. His mother's name was Naamah the Ammonite, and Nabiyam his son reigned in his place. Well, we've changed the channel from the Israel channel to the Judah channel, but things aren't looking any better. What we see here in Judah is increasing forgetfulness of the Lord and increasing sin. Most people are familiar with the concept of compounding interest. Long-term investments often have a principal amount that then earns interest. But then you reinvest that earned interest, and now that interest earns interest, and so on and so forth. That's a good thing when we're thinking about investment strategies, but a bad thing when it comes to rebellion against the Lord. The principle of sin earns the interest of sin, and then that interest of sin earns more interest of sin. And this is a key characteristic about sin that we need to take note of. Compounding sin is one of the reasons why we should run screaming away from rebellion and sin and into the merciful arms of our Lord. Make no mistake, sin is deadly and devastating. It does not play games. And take note, sin does not get better on its own. Sin begets sin. Rebellion compounds rebellion. Darkness strives to get darker. Evil is never still. That is the natural course of insurrection against God if it's left uninterrupted. Every one of us should cringe at the sin in our lives and run as hard as we can away from it 
to Jesus our Savior. Remember, as the years of Solomon's reign passed by, he became less and less faithful to the Lord. It was a slippery slope. He followed his many wives into idolatry and even built high places for them, which was completely forbidden by the Lord. Why did Solomon do this? Perhaps he did it because he simply took for granted his status before the Lord, like we can do sometimes. Or maybe he placed the smile of his wife over the smile of God. Husbands can do that sometimes. Or maybe he was tempted to engage in the pleasures of sin that accompanied idol worship. As we know, sin is pleasurable for the time. Until the trap springs. We're tempted to do that too. Or maybe he saw some kind of political benefits, the pragmatics to incorporating idols. We can do that. Or maybe he came to believe that these idols were actually gods. And could add some kind of blessing to his kingdom. He tried to synchronize the gods of the world and get the best out of them, the benefits of all truth is God. Oh, I'll just, I'll incorporate this into my life as well. And yet it's inconsistent with the one true God. We can do those kinds of things. There's probably some combination of all these motivations and there's probably other motivations I haven't listed. We are also susceptible to all these failures and we must soberly evaluate ourselves. And whatever Solomon's motivation was, there's this much that is clear from verses 4 to 6 of chapter 11. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not wholly follow the Lord as David his father had done. And, And we know David failed. We'll get into that in a minute. You know the difference between Solomon and David? David repented. But Solomon does not appear to have completely repented. That's the difference between wholehearted as a sinful man and not wholehearted. Now, unfortunately, in this story of Rehoboam, Solomon's son, we see sin compounding from father to son, and we see the devastating effect. First, as we know, the once gloriously united kingdom of Israel under Solomon is shredded to right at the beginning of Rehoboam's reign. And we're also given this gut-wrenching story about an invasion from Egypt. And this says it all. The king of Egypt invades. Apparently there's not enough strength in Judah to withstand him at all. And the invasion seems like a blitzkrieg, unchallenged, goes straight to Jerusalem. And the king of Egypt takes away everything. That's what the scripture says. He takes everything away. And we can't miss the message here. Remember when God redeemed Israel out of Egypt through Moses Remember that they took the spoils of the people of Egypt with them. They plundered the Egyptians without even fighting them. God did it. And they took those treasures with them to the promised land, gold, silver, and precious gems. Remember how Solomon made silver and gold common in Jerusalem. Remember that? Now all of that blessing and prosperity and the security it represented, guess where it's going? Back to the land of slavery back to Egypt. In other words, all that treasure, God is saying, it came from me and you've lost it because of your increasing rebellion against me. You're unrepented of rebellion. God gives and he takes away. Blessed be his name. Is that taking away was an opportunity for Israel to repent, for Judah to repent. Rehoboam's kingdom is greatly diminished because of his sin. And we have this final illustration to really drive it home. He has to replace the gold shields of his father, Solomon, with bronze shields, which is nothing in comparison to the gold. The kingdom is faded. The sparkle is gone. And the reason for it is his rebellion. And can you see how sin compounded through Solomon into his son, Rehoboam? 
Solomon compromises with idols, and then Rehoboam expands and continues that revolt against God. He normalizes that revolt. Under Rehoboam, Judah creates idol shrines all over the place, and there is special mention of the Asherah pole, the Asherah totem pole, the, the fertility goddess. And we get that, that idea of the male prostitutes. In other words, all the activity that goes along with the fertility goddess. All the sexual immorality. All out sexual immorality. You see, they embrace, the, the, the Judeans embrace immorality as good and healthy. In fact, it's wrong not to celebrate, not to engage in immorality. Does that sound familiar? Because of insurrection against the Lord and the compounding of sin from Solomon to his son, things are getting worse in Judah and Jerusalem. But hold on, hold on. Take heart. God disrupts our inherited sin with his grace. And so let's move into the second part. And that's disruptive grace. We're going to read 1 Kings chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. And you're going to notice that there's not much here about Rehoboam's son, Abiyam. But what it here is crucial to take note of, we already saw that Solomon's heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God. And then we saw that this revolt against the Lord increased in Rehoboam. Now, as we go to read this, what would we expect to see in Rehoboam's son, Abiyam? We expect to see more sin, compounding sin, right? And sure enough, that is what we're going to see. 1 Kings chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. Now in the 18th year of King Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, Abiyan began to reign over Judah. He reigned for three years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Maaka, the daughter of Abishalom. And he walked in all the sins that his father did before him. And his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father. Nevertheless, for David's sake, the Lord his God gave him a lamp in Jerusalem, setting up his son after him, and establishing Jerusalem, because David did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, and did not turn aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. Now there was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all the days of his life. The rest of the acts of Abiyam and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the King of Judah? And there was war between Abiyam and Jeroboam, and Abiyam slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the city of David, and Asa, his son, reigned in his place. And as I mentioned, there's not a lot of writing here about Abiyam. He only reigned three years. But there are crucial notes in the text. First, we're hit with the reality of that compounding sin that we've been talking about. It We see it just like we would have expected to see it. Abiyam walks in all of the sins of his father. So blatant idolatry, vulgar immorality, that's what he walks in. And we're told outright that his heart is not wholly true to the Lord his God. He's unfaithful to the covenant with God. He's unfaithful in his relationship with God, with the Lord. And that's really what's at the core of all the problems here in Judah. Hearts that are not wholly true to the Lord or hearts that are unfaithful to the Lord. Adulterous hearts. Think about this. What is the most important characteristic of every human being and certainly every Christian and certainly every member of Crossway Church and certainly everyone hearing me today? What is the most important characteristic? Well, if you take Abiyam as an example, it, it's not, we don't need a bunch of writing about his economic policy or his international politics or his, his, his good looks or his bad looks as it may, we don't know, or, or how strong his military was, which probably wasn't that strong, or all the wives that, it, we, that he had, and although we probably get some detail on that. We do get some detail on that in, in Chronicles, or, or about his officials. I mean, we can glean some things if we're given that data, but that's not what we really need to know. Kings is saying to us, 
God is saying to us through the scriptures, here's what you really need to know about Abiyam. Here's what you really need to know about anyone. Here's what you really need to know about yourself. What we really need to know is how true our hearts are to the Lord. That's what matters. That's the standard. That's the measurement. How true are our hearts to the Lord? It matters for a king of Judah. That's what matters for everyone. It's what matters for you and it's what matters for me. If a heart is wholly true, then God will be our God. If a heart is not wholly true, then what would, he, what would we expect? We would expect God to reject, right? More on that in just a moment. And about now you may be grieved over the sorrow of compounding sin, your own compounding sin. You may be thinking about the pattern of sin that you have passed along to your children, the bad parts of your example. Or you may be thinking about sins that you actually committed against your children. Or you may be thinking of the patterns of sin you will pass along to your children in the future. Or you may be stuck on the pattern of sin that your parents passed along to you. This can be discouraging to say the least, right? It is right for us to grieve this reality of the heritage of human sin. It is a sorrowful state of affairs. Nevertheless, we need to look steadily at it because it helps us to interpret the world and it helps us to understand our own lives as we see the state of things as they truly are. Dads, you and I are passing along sin to our kids and it's not something new, it's old, it's inescapable. It's the human state without God's intervention. We inherited sin from our fathers who, would inherit it, who inherited it from their fathers and so on and so forth all the way back to Adam. When Adam rebelled, we were all cursed with the same inner impulse to revolt against God. And when our immediate fathers sinned, we, we went further. We picked up on their example. And when we sin, our children are impacted and influenced by our sin. And this is why it's so imperative. Knowing this fact, understanding that this should interpret our world for us, that I am a sinner and I will fail and my children will experience it and they will be impacted and influenced by it. This is why it's so imperative that our children not only recognize that we're sinners, that they're sinners like us, but that they see us repent from sin that they understand what righteousness looks like, what a holy, devoted heart does. They need to see us leaning into sanctification that God is working in us, and they need to see us growing into the image of Christ. They need to see us broken and humble at times. We must pass along to them not only the inevitability of our sin, but also our repentance and our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They need to see us following our Lord as his disciples, and they need to hear us calling, follow me as I follow Christ. Nevertheless, this reality of compounding hereditary rebellion is powerful and devastating in every honest dad, in every honest mom, in every honest Christian, every honest person knows that we need grace to save us. We need the grace of God, and that is precisely what we see in the kingdom of Judah with Abiyam. Back to verses 4 to 5. Nevertheless, for David's sake, the Lord his God gave him a lamp in Jerusalem, setting up his son after him and establishing Jerusalem because David did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and did not turn aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. 
Now, do you see the grace here? There's really very little difference between idolatrous Israel, the northern kingdom, and idolatrous Judah, the southern kingdom. There's very little difference between Kings Jeroboam in the north and King Abiyam in the south. And yet, while the Lord will cut off Jeroboam's dynasty because of his rebellion, and the Lord will cut off several other dynasties in Israel in the northern kingdom because of their revolt against him. Our God is going to continue the dynasty of David through the sons and the grandsons and the great-grandsons of David, including Abiyam, the sinner, who is not repentant. Why? What's the difference? Why would God keep the dynasty of David intact and, and, and keep a lamp for them in, in Jerusalem and continue that dynasty forever while he won't do it for other kings? Upon first glance of the scripture up there on the screen, it may seem that this blessing is based entirely on David's obedience. But we get a big hint there. It's not just a hint, it's glaring. Glaring evidence that this cannot be. Because it's clear that David's obedience was far from perfect, right? We know that David took another man's wife. And then he had that man, he, that man Uriah, he had that man murdered in an attempt to cover up his sin. That's pretty egregious. And that was meant to be an understatement, by the way. I don't mean to say that murder and adultery are just slightly egregious. They're massively egregious. It's not that David's obedience was unimportant or uninvolved in God's promise. It's that God's faithfulness is what is truly in view here. God had chosen and promised David that his dynasty would last forever. And God's promise is rock solid, unwavering, as sure as it can be. David's sons will always be king forever because of God's gracious promise to keep that dynasty alive. Therefore, right here, in the midst of treachery from one of David's sons, when God should wipe out David's line, much like he will do to Jeroboam, instead, God remembers his promise and he reaffirms it and he continues it and that is grace. That is the grace of God. And that is how God's grace works. His grace calls forth our, our obedience. His promises prompt us to worship him. But our obedience and our worship, it, it's it's. It, it, we, through those things, we never earn grace through those things. The grace that we receive from God is never deserved. It's always based on His promises. It's always despite our mutinous hearts. And it always disrupts the continuity, the compounding, the hereditary nature of our sin that we would pass along. But God interrupts it and disrupts it and stops it. He stops it in our own hearts. He disrupts the continuity of sin in our own lives and begins to grow us into the image of Christ and he stops it in the hearts of our children and what we would pass along to them and he disrupts it and he gives grace to them so that they too can overcome sin. Do you believe that? Do you know his grace? You can know it today as you trust the Lord Jesus Christ. That goes from father to son, from mother to daughter, and between all of God's people. The disruption of the continuity and the hereditary nature of sin. Take heart, brothers and sisters. God disrupts our inherited sin with his grace. And that brings us to our third part today, and that's indicative hope. There's a hope that's indicated in the final story of the king here. Now, if God's grace is actively working, even in spite of Abiyah's treachery against the Lord, his insurrection against the Lord, 
then what might we expect to see next? How about the emergence of hope among God's people? If grace is active, salvation comes, and hope is given to God's people. In this case, maybe we'll see hope for the kingdom of Judah, as broken as it is. In our case, we'll see hope for us and for our children and for our children's children, as broken as we are. Let me read to you our longest portion for today. It's 1 Kings chapter 15, verses 9 through 24, starting in verse 9. It's a little bit long. Hang in there. It's worth the story. In the 20th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, Asa began to reign over Judah, and he reigned 41 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Maacah, the daughter of Abisholam. And Asa did what was right in the eyes of the Lord as David his father had done. He put away the male cult prostitutes out of the land and removed all the idols that his fathers had made. He also removed Maacah, his mother, from being queen mother because she had made an abominable image for Asherah. And Asa cut down her image and burned it at the brook Kidron. But the high places were not taken away Nevertheless, the heart of Asa was wholly true to the Lord all his days, and he brought into the house of the Lord the sacred gifts of his father and his own sacred gifts, silver and gold and vessels. And there was war between Asa and Baasha, king of Israel, all their days. Baasha, king of Israel, went up against Judah and built Ramah, that he might permit no one to go out or come into Asa, king of Judah. Then Asa took all the silver and the gold that were left in the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house and gave them into the hands of his servants. And King Asa sent them to Ben-Hadad, the son of Tabramam, into the hand into the hands of oh sorry the son of Hezion, king of Syria, who lived in Damascus, saying. Let there be a covenant between me and you, as there was between my father and your father. Behold, I am sending to you a present of silver and gold. Go, break your covenant with Baasha, king of Israel, that he may withdraw from me. Verse 20. And Ben-Hadad listened to King Asa and sent the commanders of his armies against the cities of Israel and conquered Ejon, Dan, Abel, Beth, Maaka, and all Chinneroth with all the land of Naphtali. And when Baasha heard of it, he stopped building Ramah, And he lived in Terza. Then King Asa made a proclamation to all Judah. None was exempt, and they carried away the stones of Ramah and its timber with which which Baasha had been building. And with them, King Asa built Geba of Benjamin and Mizpah. Now the rest of all the acts of Asa and his might and all that he did and the cities that he built, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? But in his old age, he was diseased in his feet. And Asa slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David, his father. And Jehoshaphat, his son, reigned in his place. And so we read about the grace of God to the house of David. And then what happens next? Along comes a king, the son of a sinful father, the grandson of a sinful grandfather, who for some, uh, the great-grandson of a sinful great-grandfather, who for some reason breaks the pattern of compounding sin. For some reason breaks the pattern of compounding sin, breaks the principle of hereditary rebellion, and has a heart for the Lord. The writer goes so far as to say that King Asa's heart was wholly true to the Lord all his days. Where does this come from? What happened? Why the interruption to the clear descent into chaos? Only one reason is possible. God's intervening grace. God in his sovereign goodness, in his faithful promise to David, his son, brings about a king who looks to him. The Lord stepped in and saved. He gave grace to King Asa, and through the king, he gave grace 
to the people. And now the idols are taken away. Now the stain of sexual immorality is dealt with. It's put away. Now even nepotism lacks power over righteousness. That's pretty strong, right? That's pretty powerful. The king removes his mother from her office because she sinned with abominable idolatry. And now the people will experience steady leadership from one king in Judah for 41 years. Now treasures will be returned to the house of the Lord. Now grace reigns. Now hope emerges. You see, when grace comes in, the power of sin is broken and it can no longer demand obedience like it did before from slaves. And hope is born. Hope for a future. Hope for life and hope for living. Hope, precious hope in the grace of God. Do you see the effects of hereditary sin on your life? Do you see the effects of hereditary sin on the lives of those you love? Don't give up hope. Turn to the grace of God to deliver. Throw yourself on his mercy. Humble yourself before the Lord. Lift up your worship to him. That same grace brought to us in Jesus Christ is our hope that God will break the power of sin wherever it is found in those that we love. That hope never ends. Cry out to him for his grace. You probably have some questions about Asa as well. When you look at the text there, maybe you know his story from Chronicles as well. And as much as he is commended here, some things are missing. First, the high places of worship are not taken away. So he goes a long way to purifying Judah, but not all the way. And second, in his war with Israel, he trusts in shrewd international politics, and frankly, he trusts in bribes, once again takes the treasures out of the temple and hands them over rather than in the Lord. He trusts in those things rather than the Lord. The second chronicle paints a bleaker picture of Asa than what we have here, and it goes into more detail. Kings gives us a more positive picture, but even while it is more positive, we are shown again, even with a wholehearted human king, like Asa or even David himself, there is a lacking. We are left wanting. And the disruption of heredity, compounding sin, is never as complete as we need it to be. Because we need it to be completely broken. And that taints our hope, if that's all we have. And so then, what is going on here? Why are these three kings, Rehoboam, Abiyam, and Asa, given to us in history in this manner, in kings? To show us, it's given to us to show us the hope of what grace can achieve. And at the same time, as giving us a glimpse of indicating what grace can achieve, At the same time, it's teaching us that we need more grace than what can simply come from a human king. That we must not look to just any person, any leader, any religious leader, any political leader, any moral leader, any social leader. No leader can give us what we need. We do need a king. And we need a human king. That's one of the clear messages of kings. A good king can be a savior. And when a king is wholehearted, when he's repentant, when even he sins, that kingdom thrives. When a king is less than that, that kingdom withers and everyone in it suffers as well. And that principle can be applied to kings and it can be applied on on that large scale. It can be applied to the leaders of nations. It can be applied to regional leaders. It can also be applied to head of households. And that principle can be applied to leadership wherever it's found, certainly with fathers in our homes. But even the best leaders or kings cannot be the real Savior that we truly need. We need someone who does not inherit sin from our father, Adam. We need someone who can rule us with a perfect wholeheartedness instead of a tainted wholeheartedness that needs repentance. 
We need a Savior King who is called wholehearted and has zero exceptions in his biography, like David. The hope that we see here in Asa's kingdom is only indicative of what that greater, final Savior King will bring my brothers and sisters, my friends, take heart. God disrupts our inherited sin with his grace. I want to ask the ushers.